Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How are we getting on? So, patch 12 is upon us, and it brings with it the first of the Vault Raids in Vault 94, the display cases that many of us have been waiting for for quite some time, and a significant overhaul to the perk system in Nuclear Winter. So, I think this is going to be one of the first big steps towards reinvigorating the game, particularly for those of us who've been playing for a long time since launch and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of potential in here and it's a great step along the road to bringing some new life back into Fallout 76, which I think a lot of us are, are very, very ready for. So let's jump in, take a look at the patch notes and see what Bethesda have got for us. So we're looking at a 7 gigabyte console download and 2 gig for PC. It's quite a substantial patch. Let's have a look at the uh, finer details, shall we? So first things first. New Vault Raid, Vault 94. I know a lot of people are excited for this, I am. It's very, very cool to have some proper late game content coming in. So, the opening of Vault 94 marks the arrival of our first Vault Raid, which is a challenging dungeon experience designed to be completed by a team of up to four level 50 plus characters. Judging by the description here and what we've received in the past through their uh, blog post and the update at QuakeCon earlier in the month, end of last month, one or the other, um, it sounds like this will be a fitting challenge for the end game, if uh, somewhat more manageable probably for players who are particularly high level. But over the next few days we'll jump in and have a look, see what they've got to say about it. Vault 94 uses instancing technology which will prevent players who are not on your team from affecting or interrupting your team's experience. So specifically, you and your group and nobody else will be in there. Well, other people will be, but they won't. you won't see them or encounter them. So, big note first. We're opening Vault 94 today, that's August 20th, on PC. And if all goes according to plan, we know how that goes, um, then they will be opening up on console in the next few days, presumably in time for the weekend. That being said, however, if there are significant issues, they will try and fix those before they bring them out on console, and possibly that could include removing Vault Raids altogether until they're fixed, so it's something to be aware of. On the other hand, that it applies a nice, um, healthy desire to get it right. So if you have got problems, hop onto the Reddit, hop onto the Fallout forums on BethesdaNet. Make sure you're uh, updating Bethesda with any details that you might have, any experiences. I'm sure they'll very much welcome the feedback, especially as they've got more Vault Raids lined up in the future. So knowledge is power and all that for them. So let's have uh, the best experience we can and do our part in contributing to that. So, tune in to begin. Start a Vault Raid by listening to the Vault 94 Emergency Broadcast Radio Station. So it sounds like you'll be able to just tune into the radio station wherever you are on the map and basically fast travel straight into the raid. Um, you won't actually have to traipse all the way up to Vault 94. That makes it a lot more efficient and easy to dive into. So you can just head to your camp, make sure you're geared up and ready to go, jump straight in, do the raid, hop back out back to your camp and repeat which we'll touch on in just a moment. Yeah, that should be a nice practical way of doing it, I think. So, three missions to complete. Vault 94 features three missions, Dead in the Water, Meltdown, and Washout. Each mission lasts for one week, it repeats every three weeks, and only one mission at a time will be available to play. So, first week will be Dead in the Water, second one will be Meltdown, third week will be Washout, and then it will repeat back to Dead in the Water. Vault 94 will become temporarily inaccessible for around three hours when one mission rotates to the next one each week. Like a mini hotfix, essentially, to change it. So, we'll be taking them offline whilst uh, they tweak things. So, we'll see in a moment that's actually uh, an, has an additional interesting effect. But, first things first, three difficulty modes. You could choose Novice, Standard or Expert mode every time you play a mission. Novice mode is untimed, Standard and Expert do have a quest timer, so that's an overall global timer for the event. Uh, and they feature more difficult encounters, and therefore better loot and more XP. Presumably more caps as well, that would seem to be in keeping with it. Although it doesn't stipulate that here. So if your time runs out, or the entire team is downed, then you will need to start the mission over. It's worth bearing in mind if you want to solo them as well, because the entire team is just you, and if you die, you won't be getting back up again, you'll have to start from scratch. Which is about what you'd expect, I suppose, as well. So, claim new rewards. Complete Vault 94 missions to earn XP, caps, improved repair kits, which are previously unavailable from the Scorch Beast Queen, so in keeping with the end game th um, nature of the content, you get this end game reward. 
still have my mixed feelings, as I said uh, on Thursday, but it's not exactly uh, game changing. It's more of a lazy item than anything, so it's what it is. Legendary Scrip is a reward, that's cool. Crafting materials and items like weapons, armor, and plans are also available. So, completing a mission on any difficulty will also reward Vault 94 Steel, which is used to craft unique vault armor sets, which grant special bonuses to the wearer. So previously I was wondering whether or not this was going to be a retroactive um, sort of effect that uh, applied to all armor. It sounds like it's just the vault armor sets that you get out of the uh, raids and they will grant um, item set bonuses. So if you have a full set of whatever it may be, um, then you'll gain an additional, presumably legendary style effect as a result of having that all equipped. But that is just the uh, vault armors. So. Those have to be crafted with Vault 94 seal for the armors coming out of 94 anyway. I'd imagine subsequent vaults will have their own variations. Vault armor sets are awarded via plans. By completing standard or expert mode missions, you won't be getting them on novice runs. You will get the uh, Vault 94 steel from novice runs though, so worth bearing in mind. Vault armor can be crafted at armor workbenches. Vault 94 steel, Vault armor and Vault armor plans cannot be dropped, traded or sold. So, once you've got them, they're yours and yours alone. Also means you won't be able to move them to other characters, they'll have to get them independently as well. The Vault Mission Rewards can be earned once per difficulty mode, per mission, per day. Which basically means, on any given day, you'll be able to get three sets of rewards. One for Novice, one for Expert, one, one for Standard. Don't know why I put them in that order, but okay. Um, the exception to that, from the look of this, will be the Changeover Day. If you jump in in the morning, you'll be able to do the first event, do that three times, get your daily rewards there. Presumably, after the downtime and the new mission comes up, you'll be able to repeat. Now, some of that does depend on when the changeover time or the reset time is for that, on the daily timer. Um, it's possible that it uh, won't, depending on when that timer is, but we'll have to see. Yeah, we'll find out when we jump in. Either way, it does limit the amount you can uh, gain in a given amount of time. Which I know some people have mixed feelings on. I think um, extending the lifespan is not necessarily a bad thing. I don't know, for those who have a lot more playtime, I can see them being frustrated by this. But for those of us like me who um, have more limited playtime, I think it'll just be fine because we'll essentially self-impose that by having a life outside the game. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to this. I'll be giving it a go hopefully later on tonight, failing that tomorrow. If you guys are interested in uh, jumping into the stream, maybe uh, joining a little run through the vaults, then uh, That'd be the way to do it. Come say hello on stream and we'll see what we can do. Uh, depending on how busy it is, I might have a crack at soloing it as well. Hopefully I'll also do um, a couple of videos on this as well once we kind of get the hang of it a little more, which would be cool. So do watch out for those. Speaking of, in our recent deep dive article on 4 you can find out more details about Vault 94, which I also covered in a video last Thursday, and you should be able to find it somewhere up above my head about now as well. So do check that out if you haven't already. And while you're there, you can check out the most recent camp build as well. That was looking pretty darn cool. So, yeah, have a look. <laughs> so, camp display cases. I think this is something a lot of us have been very, very keen for. We're definitely up for more decoration type items. This is one small step in the right direction. And over Thursday, I've had a hard time putting these together. I've uh, said in previous blog posts, things like that. But the actual mechanics of this have been a bit more of a challenge. I think player vending has helped them with that in some ways. But apparently not in others, because it has taken a while. So display cases and new camp objects that you can use to show off weapons, magazines, bobbleheads and other items you've collected. Use the new displays tab in the camp build menu, found between stash boxes and floor decor, to construct a variety of different displays. Now they still haven't mentioned power armor displays, so I'm going to go with a hunch that they're not in yet, but they, you can see a power armor stand in Garahan Mining, so... Maybe they are in there, we'll have to see when I jump into the game later. And fingers crossed, we'll be getting them eventually, even if not now. So, yeah. It's um, politely Pester Bethesda if they're not there. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I'm quite happy about this, it should be cool. Functionality wise, once built, you can assign items to your displays directly from your stash, like with player vending. Items you assign will remain in the stash. Unfortunately, they'll occupy space in your stash, but. They do have to maintain um, a certain load on the server, so. or minimise the load on the server, rather. Definitely something uh, recent weeks have shown to be a valuable angle. So a new icon will appear next to the item's name to indicate which items in your list are currently on display. It's a little trophy, I believe. 
You can place up to 30 displays at once, which is actually quite a lot given the scale you can actually build a camp to, so that's quite cool. Each type of display has a maximum number of items that you can assign to it. And more detail also available on a video on the playlist that I linked before. And um, following the link here in the uh, in the patch notes as well if you'd care to, which of course will be linked down below as well. But yeah, nice to be able to display a few things. I think we'd like uh, a few more options, something along the junk decoration line, but uh, it's a step in the right direction. It certainly personalise your camp a bit more. And for those of us who don't really use magazines and bobbleheads, they've got another function beyond just selling them for caps now, which is quite cool. Of course, that doesn't mean they're going to clutter up your stash, but swings and roundabouts. So, more general changes. Atomic Shop, a standee has been added to the Berkeley Springs train station, which is where the purveyor is located, that can be activated to visit the Atomic Shop while playing in adventure or survival mode. Bit of an odd choice, this. I would understand it if it, they were planning to remove the option to get to the Atomic Shop from the map menu, um, so that basically you had to be out of world or use one of these items to access it. But I can't imagine for the life of me why they would do such a thing. It seems very, very unlikely that they are going to do such a thing. It would imply that they're going to make um, microtransactions less front and centre than they are at the moment. Not that they exactly stuff the your face as it is, but... That would be, I think, a change that a lot of people would be happy to see. But at the same time, it doesn't really make a right lot of sense to remove access from the, the map menu. So I very much doubt they're going to be doing that. So this just seems like a, a weird addition Assuming there is a good reason for it, but yeah, a little odd that one. If anybody's got any insight to offer, I'd be more than interested to hear it. So down in the comments if you want to uh, chip in on that one. It's a, a bizarre change, that. The so caps. Increase the maximum number of caps per character from 25,000 to 30,000. This, I think, is a teeny tiny little mistake, if I'm honest. Having more caps seems like a great thing, and as regards buying things from in-world vendors, uh, the White Springs or whatever, um, it's most welcome, particularly with getting plans that those things are expensive. However, when it comes to player vending, that's just going to have one effect, one effect only. The most valuable items are going to jump by 5,000 caps in the cost, and you basically get instantaneous inflation, which will benefit nobody, frankly, in my opinion. Um, and I, it's a player-driven re request. People want to be able to have more caps. But personally, I don't think there's any benefit whatsoever to it. Um, and having read quite a bit on Reddit about it, nobody has come up with an argument that convinced me at all yet. Yet. So I don't think this is a sensible change. I think it just introduces a small amount of inflation. It is only a small amount, but it doesn't actually achieve anything, in my opinion. So... They have alluded at QuakeCon and in other places as well to players developing their own economies, basically trading those super high value items, the ridiculously powerful armors, the TSE guns, that sort of thing, for other similarly powerful objects and not using caps because supposedly they're more valuable than the maximum number of caps you can have, um, which Bethesda are not overjoyed about. But I think this will have zero impact on that. I think they'll still say, nope, 30 caps isn't, 30,000 caps rather is not enough either. And it will maintain, the status quo will be maintained, it will carry on as it has today. So I don't think this is a particularly sensible change on any level. I don't think it's a, a major issue either, but I don't think it, I don't, it's not a good change really in my opinion. I don't think it was uh, worth putting any time into, to be honest. There we go, just my two cents. So items. All Enclave Scout armor mods are now available for purchase at the Enclave Armory, so if you can get into the White Springs Bunker, which most of us probably can by now, um, you can now get armor mods for the Enclave Scout armor, which is cool because it's a, a new type of armor added to Fallout 76 that wasn't present in Fallout 4, which is always cool. Um, not necessarily the most effective thing in the world, but it's nice to have something a bit different. It's got a, an interesting and unique style, but the mods for it were rather difficult to get, even more so than other types of armor, so having a singular place you can find them and get them is going to make players more inclined to use that armor, which is cool. Variety is the spice of life after all. Nice to have something a little different. You never know, with any luck, players might uh, be a bit more inclined to you know, drop some of the outfits and just have their armor visible. You know, it's, as I say, variety. Why not? <laughs> so that's a cool little change. Flame of Fuel can now be crafted using the Tinker's Workbench. It was previously on the chemistry bench, not a bit too... Try again. Not a particularly big or significant change, but it is what it is. It moves it to a slightly more findable logic, logical place, so that's fine. 
doubled the amount of ultrasite ammo produced by all ultrasite ammo recipes. So if you're using those particular guns, you're farming the Scorch Beast Queen, something like that. They're not particularly, well, there's not much point using them against Scorch because they're not particularly challenging unless you're getting swarmed. Um, however, all the non-flux ingredient costs have been increased by 50%. So it's not in keeping with the uh, increase because they've doubled the output and only half increase the um, the cost but about less than half the discount the flux so it makes sense to make it cost a lot more but it also makes uh, ultra sight weapons more viable to keep stocked with ammo which is yeah a welcome little change nice little quality of life thing speaking of nice little quality of life things burnt books and magazines can now be scrapped to produce one raw cloth hopefully that'll include the scrap all option because um, up until now, you didn't pick these things up, or at least not deliberately, and on occasions where you might pick one up without noticing by accident, you wind up them cluttering up your inventory, um, adding a few random pounds to your carry weight, which is, as always, at a premium. So, being able to use them for, basically, so far as I can tell, toilet paper, is probably not a bad thing. <laughs> a welcome little quality of life adjustment. A little thing, but nice. Jetpack mods for power armor have now been added to Ultra Sight and Raider power armor. Fine, kind of brings them in line with everything else, that's fine. Personally wouldn't have done it on the Raider Power Armor, but I don't think it makes a right lot of sense. I think that's sort of thing should be a tad beyond Raiders, especially given the how ramshackle and cobbled together Raider Power Armor is. But, okay, fair enough, whatever. <laughs> that's just a, a personal uh, creativity difference of opinion, I suppose, but there we go. Not a big deal. This one is a slightly bigger deal, and that is that recon scopes can no longer be used to mark other players in PvP. Um, I think this is a good change. Uh, currently, you can tag a player with a recon scope, and you might not necessarily be able to see that player, and you should still be able to basically spam them or blind fire them and hit them anyway. This will make that considerably more difficult, meaning a greater skill component is required for PvP. Is one very, very small step in the right direction, in my opinion. Still a lot of giant leaps required on that front, but we'll take any steps in the right direction we can get, I think. Perk cards. This is an interesting, again, quality of life change, but not life changing because it's not retroactive, but moving forward, particularly with uh, Wastelanders on the horizon, I think this change is going to be more valuable there. Because I think a lot of people will consider creating new characters given the, the changes that will be coming with the Wastelanders and how much of an overhaul that will be. Uh, and I, I'm interested in the archery changes that are coming with it, amongst uh, many, many other things. So uh, I will probably create a new archery based character around about that time. So this will affect me then anyway. So the change is that perk card packs, the ones you receive every five levels, will no longer award perk cards that only have a single rank. So that's basically because, as it currently stands, you can't delete, destroy, drop uh, existing perk cards. So you can wind up with the, uh, you know, potentially 20 um, expert lockpick perks, which obviously won't stack multiple times. So it just clutters up your perk menu this way, for future characters at least. You'll find that um, you have a less cluttered perk menu, which is a welcome little change, I think. So, quests and events. A couple of very, very cool changes here. I think uh, I'm excited to explore. Charleston Capital Courthouse, first off. We've reworked the interior layout and design of Car Charleston Capital Courthouse to better support the Key to the Past quest line. So this was a couple of weeks ago that I mentioned this one. You should be able to find a video in the playlist on the card if you want a few more details. But the short version is they're going to change the layout of the inside of the Charleston Capital building to make it easier to navigate, probably. Um, and allow it to support the quest key to the past a little better. So the objectives themselves haven't changed, but the space that you have to explore to complete them has. For me, I use this location as part of a run for screws when I need a large number of those, so that will probably change that. They've also added several new notes to the area, so there's a little bit more background and lore to the Chelsea Capital Building, which is cool. It makes a lot of sense given that it is the primary centre of government for the whole of the Fallout 76 map, so it makes sense to have a certain amount of law in there. Also, capital buildings and courthouses generate paperwork, so... So the courthouse and the main capital building have been split into two different interior cells, so that basically means you'll have a loading screen between the two halves. But it also means that uh, the quests that take place in each section should be a little bit more self-contained now. Um, and it allows them to have separate level ranges for the two halves of the building. 
This is significant because now both areas, if I understand correctly, will be receiving a buff in the level and difficulty of the enemies in there, which is worth noting because both of them will be, unless I'm very much mistaken, which I don't think I am, significantly more challenging than the rest of Charleston. So you step inside that building, your challenge is going to take a jump. Worth noting before you go in there. Specifically, the courthouse half of the building will now match the top of the world, which recently received a level buff, a patch 11, I believe. And the capital building level range will now match the mire, which should be even more difficult. Or at least the lowest level of enemy spawning will be subsequently higher. So, worth noting if you're heading in there, expect to find it a little bit more challenging than you had in the past. And please note, the Office of the Registrar that must be accessed during the Recruitment Blues quest line, which I believe is one of the Brotherhood of Steel ones, has been relocated from the courthouse to the main capital building. So that's literally a whole segment, whole office, that has been moved from one building to another. So it will represent quite a significant change to the layout of the place. Much like they did with Morgantown Airport a few months ago, which was a fun little change. It was a good overhaul, that one. So I've got... There's a certain level of optimism that this will make it for a positive change and a fun area to explore. Looking forward to it. Speaking of Morgantown Airport, we've made significant updates to Morgantown Airport's exterior this time to further improve on early game questing experiences for new players. Encounters in this area have been reworked to offer better combat experiences. Very cool. They were a bit bland. You just run around a shot scorched dude just kind of ran at you in the open. So hopefully that'll be a bit more interesting. The medical hut, which is out on the tar tarmac rather, behind the main terminal, um, has had a layout and design update to better support the final departure quest. Tentative plans and safe for work quests have been given a, are now given by a terminal located across from the medical hut, rather than I'm not sure if they were automatically given to you or if they were inside the main terminal before. But either way, the the pickup point for those have been moved out onto the main tarmac. And advanced responder training quest entry has been removed from the airport's interior terminal and the objective now appears automatically after you complete tentative plans. Whereas before you could quite easily miss that because you had to go back into the airport and all the way back through to the um, main office where, where you find Maria Chavez uh, in order to pick that quest up. So it should flow a little more smoothly now and you shouldn't miss it so often, sure. A couple of additional changes focused on Morgantown Airport. Collision course, which is the event that takes place behind it. The event no longer automatically begins when players enter the event area. Not a big deal for players in the area the first time, you probably do want to complete the event then. But if you're returning to the area or just passing through, it'll no longer trigger just as a result of your presence. Instead, players must start the event by firing a flare from a new mortar that has been added to the event location. But calling in that airdrop in short. We've also made consistency updates to the collision course objectives and improved the vertibot's pathing and delivery method when it drops off its cargo at the end of the event. So basically the vertibot should move more easily and it should drop more reliably in a sensible location. That's fine. The consistency thing I'm curious about. I'm guessing, well I hope that means you won't be sat twiddling your thumbs for quite so long wondering whether or not the next wave of Scorch to go attack you. Because um, a little bit of recovery time, particularly for a low-level player, is good. But it ends up being inordinately long sometimes while it tries to figure out what it's doing. So hopefully they'll improve that. So daily quests. All daily quests now persist when logging out and logging back in. Additionally, some dailies checkpoint your progress to make it easy to resume where you left off. So we've also substantially increased the cap and XP rewards awarded by many daily quests. Dailies are meant to be something fun to do every day, so the rewards have been increased to make them more enticing to complete. So the only big thing left there that puts people off that I can see is the cap cost for fast traveling to them, but basically it means you get better rewards for completing daily quests, gives you more incentive to do it, which is fine. Hopefully encourage more players to play more often, which is, you know, always welcome. So please note, we're currently aware of an issue that prevents some daily quests in the Maya region from starting again after the first time you complete them. We're investigating this and plan to address it in an upcoming update, so in a future patch. My guess here would be that uh, it's probably something they've come across later than everything else, and uh, they haven't yet got a fix for it, and don't want to delay the patch in order to fix this one little thing, they'll deal with it later. Makes sense to me. A couple more cool changes on the user interface. Press and hold activators. Players must now hold down the activate button to enter furniture, start playing an instrument, or to drink from an open water source. 
This has been implemented to reduce the likelihood of performing these actions by accident. So hopefully, no more gargling toilet water when you're reaching for that box of ammo that somebody has casually tossed in there. Always welcome. Quest marker descriptions. This is an interesting one. Quest markers that appear in the world now display objective text for quests that they belong to, which you can enable or disable via the settings menu, and you can adjust their display distance as well. So, that's interesting. Basically, it should allow you to discern more easily which quest marker you're looking at when you see it in-game. Which is good, I think. It might clutter your UI up a little bit more, so mixed feelings, but depending on however you feel about it, jump into the settings, you can change that. So. And the throwable weapons counter has been updated, so grenades, mines, throwing knives, etc. that the player has equipped will now temporarily appear when unholstering a weapon or reloading a ranged weapon, and it will disappear immediately when holstering a weapon as well. So in short, you should be able to see how many grenades and other throwables you have equipped more often, more easily. Always good, because it's kind of hard to keep track of how many you've got sometimes. Not a bad little change. So, pushing on quickly, Nuclear Winter. The big change to Nuclear Winter is, uh, in response to community feedback, a tweak to the perk system. Now, they mentioned this at QuakeCon. One of the big bugbears that a lot of people have, and it annoyed me ever so slightly as well, was that um, you get a lot of duplicate perks and they are basically useless to you and it's basically a dead level. So now, when you get a duplicate perk, you'll receive instead an Overseer ticket and you can save those up to claim um, a perk of your choice that you don't already own. Now, it's worth mentioning that obviously if you go for a perk that is has a special value of 9, it's going to cost you more Overseer tickets than one that, say, has a value of 1. Makes sense, that way everybody's not just jumping straight for those high-level ones, and you've actually got to work for it, it keeps people playing. Um, and it keep, it maintains the value of the more valuable perks, although you can still get them randomly, so swings and roundabouts a little bit there, but that's a, a logical scenario, I think. Additionally, perk card packs are now rewarded at each new Overseer rank, rather than at varying intervals, so you should get perks more consistently, which is a bonus. Basically, the, the feedback and the feeling has been that um, gaining power and advancing your character in Nuclear Winter was too dependent on luck, and also, of course, um, the amount of time you got to sink into it, which is a universal problem, really, with any kind of PvP in Fallout 76, anyway. So it should mean that those with less time to play should get more rewards more consistently, more easily. Hopefully that'll encourage more people to jump in and play, remove an element of the frustration. So, good change in my opinion there. Another cool change, the Overseer rank requirements to access certain areas in Vault 51 have been rebalanced. A little non-specific, but there is a heavy inclination towards very high levels to get, to different, to get access to different parts of Vault 51. As it currently stands, or well, stood prior to this patch, now, hopefully, they'll have distributed that a little more evenly, so additional areas of the vault should unlock a little bit more consistently and a bit more steadily as you rank up, so... Hopefully, you'll get a bit more to explore a bit more often, which I think is a, a welcome little change. Certainly not a game-changing one, but it add to the fun while you're stuck in the lobby waiting. So, changes to Fury no longer applies to fist weapons or unarmed attacks. Radaway has now been made much, much more effective, because it wasn't being... It wasn't proportionally effective to how rare the item was previously, so they've increased the effect of it. Makes sense. I think players generally like to see buffs more than nerfs, so I feel that make a few people happy and it makes it more useful, which is definitely valuable in Nuclear Winter. The Quick Staircase Kit has now been added, which was mentioned in a previous uh, set of notes. Short version, you can pick this up like an item in-game, much like the existing walls, things like that. Drop that down from your quick menu and it'll spawn a staircase in. Much like Fortnite, but in this case I kind of understand it, both the existing Nuclear Winter map and the upcoming Morgantown map will have a great deal of verticality in them. Have a great deal of verticality in depending on which one you're talking about. Um, so having the means to traverse vertical surfaces more easily, particularly when you've got the zone at your back or you're running from a nuke or something like that, makes a lot of sense. I can see why they've done that, I think it's it fits. We've got some balance changes to weapons, so a lot of the weights have been changed because they were very inconsistent. Now if you pick up a pistol it will weigh £5, rifles, shotguns, submachine guns will all weigh £10. Not sure that makes a great deal of sense, a massive assault rifle weighing the same as a tiny little submachine gun. Not sure about that, but okay, simple and consistent is not necessarily a bad thing. 
and heavy weapons now weigh between 20 and 30 pounds, or either 20 or 30 pounds, not quite sure which. Some of them are much bigger than the others, though. I guess it makes a certain amount of sense, but why they do that for heavy weapons and not rifle shotguns or submachine guns, I'm not entirely sure. So the radium rifle now has had its uh, recoil reduced, which is cool. That was uh, It's a good weapon, but controlling that recoil was always the biggest problem with it, so it makes it much more viable to use, that's cool. Both the handmade rifle and the assault rifle have had their ammo spawns increased, so when you get those you will now get 60 and 90. Uh, instead of 60, rather, you will now get 90 bullets. Basically, that's because these are the only two types of uh, guns to use 5.56 ammo, making the ammo very, very rare. It means you can actually use the gun more often and for longer. Good change. Combat sniper rifle now has an ammo capacity of 8 rather than 10. It means you have to reload it a little sooner. Kind of makes it a little bit weaker. It was one of the more powerful sniper options in, in Nuclear Winter, so probably a good change. Brings it a bit more into line with the other options. Still probably going to be one of the best though. Gatling gun. They've reduced its accuracy at long range, which is great because you should not be sniping with a Gatling gun. So yeah, I think that's a welcome change. It's uh, quite a popular weapon that one, so giving it a more circumstantially specific set of uses is valuable, I think. It means you, you won't be using the one weapon, you'll adapt to your circumstance more, which is a good change, I think. Reducing the minigun's reload speed makes that ridiculously powerful gun somewhat less valuable. I think that's a good thing. I'm pretty sure that's only a Scorch Beach drop as well, so... Valuable weapon, but um, now has a little bit more of a drawback, so not quite as OP as it was before. And um, a change that will probably annoy quite a few people, but I think is absolutely in the right direction. The Tesla rifle has had its area of effect range significantly nerfed. So basically, the Sayo E attack was far too powerful and too lenient. In short, E can still basically slaughter everybody, even if you miss, uh, which made playing against it very unfun. I would concur with that assessment. So now reducing that AoE range will bring its power back down to a much more manageable level. You won't be ridiculously OP if you've got a Tesla rifle now, and you won't be able to just kind of spam it at an area and take everybody out. You'll actually have to hit your targets from the sound of this. So a positive change, particularly for a BR mode, in my opinion. And a couple more changes to the UI in Nuclear Winter. Added more visual fan, added more visual fanfare for second and third place teams on the match summary screens. Yep, a little bit of an acknowledgement that you've done pretty well. That makes sense. Um, actually, kind of unique though. Most other BRs don't do that, as far as I'm aware. You either win or you lose, and that's all you get. So it's a, a little unique thing for Nuclear Winter, which is quite cool. Something else that sets it apart. Maybe a little thing, but cool. So, as this is going on quite a bit, which is kind of normal for a patch notes video, we are going to have a look at just a few of the specific bug fixes, as per usual, that I think are most interesting. There are, as you can see now, quite a lot of them, so it's probably worth having a look at the link down in the description and having a bit of a look for yourself. There may be some things in here that you find particularly interesting that don't really catch my eye, or vice versa. In the meantime, let's have a look at the few things that I have picked out. So, there's... A small handful here that I thought were particularly interesting. For the camp side of things, there's a power change. So they fixed an issue in which correctly powered items sometimes did not receive power when they were placed or moved. Useful little change. Should make those work properly now. Cool. Scrap all junk button is now correctly disabled at workbenches if the player does not have any junk in their inventory that can be scrapped. Okay. Very small UI change, but welcome. The so general changes to challenges. Uh, learn cooking recipes challenge and discover location challenges that have already been completed by a player but did not progress correctly in the challenges menu will now be marked as completed and their rewards will be granted retroactively. There's a reasonable chance next time you log in you'll find yourself with a sudden influx of atoms which I think everybody will be happy to receive. World challenges change to the chemist possum badge which is uh, one of the pioneer scouts challenges that were added a few months ago. The sub-challenge to shoot a Yaogai with a, Yaogai with a syringer now correctly completes after hitting a Yaogai with any type of syringer. Doesn't mean you have to kill it, doesn't mean you have to do anything interesting, you just gotta hit the guy. Which is cool. I think that's uh, a welcome little change. It makes uh, one element of a series of very, very difficult challenges that much more manageable. I think people will be generally happy to see that. So creatures, this one's an interesting little one. Corpses, traveling... That's not the right one at all, that wasn't what I meant to copy and paste. <laughs> 
Covering merchant corpses now correctly spawn as human corpses rather than death claw or other creatures. Okay. Um, the one I did intend to put in here, in fact, was that enemy corpses that um, have no loot on them, if the uh, RNG has dictated that you're not getting any loot off that particular body, in the past it would show a loading wheel, a constant spinning wheel, uh, which would not end. Uh, that will no longer be the case, you'll just get an empty box now, hopefully. This works according to plan. So that's a welcome change. Apparently I can't copy and paste, but there we go. Such is life. Item changes. Now, they did say that uh, one star items from higher level enemies, or and in general as well, should not be dropping as often, which is not in my experience, but there we go. There's nothing on here about that. So. A little bit salt here, but there we go. <laughs> However... Two and three star legendary melee weapons that drop as loot no longer always spawn with a 50% limb damage attribute. So, I haven't encountered this myself, but it should mean you get more variety of legendary effects on two to three star legendary melee weapons. Good change. And the furious legendary weapon attribute now correctly implies increased damage output on consecutive hits against the same target. But apparently that wasn't the case, it wasn't working properly. Um, it's actually quite a good legendary effect, so particularly for things like um, automatic weapons. So I think a lot of people could be quite frustrated by that and will be happy to see it fixed. And if they hadn't noticed, they'll be frustrated to find out that it existed at all, but at least it's fixed either way. A good change there, I think a significant one. Performance changes. Addressed an issue that could cause a crash when exiting to the main menu, and fixed an issue that could cause a crash while waiting to join a nuclear winter match from the main menu. Okay, a couple of good little crash changes, fine. And performance implemented an improvement for server performance. Now, I don't particularly like the fact that this is, change is buried in the bug fixes and is not, you know, featured with greater prominence. Because in the last few weeks, even me, who is reasonably forgiving and understanding about the struggles involved in running a game like Fallout 76, even I have to say at the moment that, frankly, the last week or two, servers have been garbage. Like the frame rate drops have been nightmarish, uh, performance has just been awful, particularly surrounding power armor as well. So that's particularly frustrating following patch 11. Hoping for more details here on fixing that, and there aren't as many as, uh, in fact, there are virtually none, which is not a happy fact either. So hopefully this performance change will, will have um, a bigger impact than its position in the patch notes will imply. But um, yeah, I don't like the fact that it's buried down here. It doesn't doesn't fill me with confidence that one which is unfortunate as i say very sadly no power armor notes in here so the fixes that we're all crying out for on that are not forthcoming which is a little frustrating so anyway things that have been fixed mission countdown players now correctly earn experience after completing each section of each missile silo subject to the once per day quest mission limit so you should now get more xp as you work through the missions the nuclear silos which was the way it was intended to work, and it wasn't. So, positive change. Makes them more valuable to run. Order of the Tadpole, trumpet sound effects at Camp Lewis now only play until the player speaks to Scout Leader Jaggy for the first time, and no longer play continuously. So those trumpet noises you can hear clean across the lake at um, Grafton Steel and other locations further away, even after you've been in there and uh, spoken to Scout Leader Jaggy. So, that will no longer be the case, and I think that's a welcome change for people's sanity in their eardrums so good little change and there's a number of bug fixes for nuclear winter as well but the one that stood out the most to me was that um, they fixed a number of damage outputs for weapons in nuclear winter following patch 11 there are a number of them that were doing incorrect damage and now they should be doing things correctly which is good so All in all, a good series of changes, some very, very cool stuff, a load of really nice quality of life changes. I'm very, very excited to get my teeth sunk into uh, Vault 94, looking forward to doing that hopefully later tonight, failing that tomorrow, we'll see how things go. Uh, it depends how long this video takes to make for starters. But yeah, I'm very excited for that, looking forward to doing that. Hopefully you guys will join me on stream for some Vault related fun, that should be cool. Um, also quite happy about display cases. Looking forward to hopefully seeing more options to decorate camps with, but this is a good step in the right direction. A few other bits and pieces that are not vastly interesting, some of the bug fixes, so on and so forth, but again, they're, they're always welcome. 
I'm a little saddened and worried and frustrated not to see significant fixes to the issues with power armor. I'm guessing that's just taking longer than they had in mind and they just haven't figured it out yet. I'm sure they are working on it and it will be implemented as soon as they can, but in the meantime, that is a frustration that we're still stuck with, which is a bit sad. Um, as I say, it was, servers have had some serious issues. I don't know if it's um, a specific problem. I don't know if there's some new duplication thing that people are uh, exploiting and causing problems, or if it's just a case that you know, they need to switch them off and on again. Um, but I've had frame rates crashing down into the teens, and that is hard on the eyes, to say the least. So. Seeing the one performance improvement note being buried so far into the patch notes does not bode well for the state of the servers, particularly after this patch. But, you know, it, it may be a good thing, we'll have to say. I mean, it won't be a bad thing, I'm sure, but I would like to have seen more prominence on that. Something I would definitely like to see Bethesda focusing on going forward, as well as the new content. Which um, I realise has to do with the number of people who've got to work on it. There's only so much that the team can do at the time. It's not the biggest team in the world. But... These things do significantly impact your gameplay experience, so it's something that does need changing. However, initially this looks like a very solid, very, very cool patch with some very, very cool features, and I'm looking forward to exploring them. Um, and obviously we'll have some follow-ups and see what actually happens and how this actually pans out over the next week or so. So do keep your eyes out for those. So as always, I do hope you guys found this useful and informative. I realise we've gone on a bit longer this time, so thank you for sticking with me. If you did enjoy the video then please do drop a like and subs and so on and so forth it's very very much appreciated social media links in the description as well if you want to catch up with me over there and keep up to date with what i'm doing any uploads and general other chaos and weirdness that's going on so please do consider catching up over there and if you haven't already do drop in on one of the live streams it's a, a lot of fun as i say we're going to tackle the vault raids this week and probably going forward as well so it should be fun times to be had there hope you'll join us for those and for those of you who really enjoy the content, please do consider supporting the channel via the join button below. Becoming a channel member, that support is hugely, hugely appreciated. If you want to have a look and find out a little bit more about it, there's some details in the description. And you can click on the join button and get a bit more information before you progress as well. So thank you very much for that. And thank you to everybody who's already done so. For now, thank you for watching. Thank you for sticking with this long video. And I look forward to speaking to you all very, very soon.